بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار uh, So this is lesson number nine in the section on Al-Qadr and it is lesson number 44 overall uh, in the series and so you should have a uh, a handout or a leaflet which basically summarizes the previous uh, seven or eight lessons <clears throat> um, in the previous lesson we finished looking at some of the doubts or some of the misconceptions in relation to al-qadr using al-qadr as an argument to justify your sin your disobedience or your disbelief and we looked at evidences from the quran and from the sunnah and from reason which refute this argument right to use al qadar the divine pre decree to justify your sin or your disobedience or your disbelief or your polytheism these arguments are, are invalid and we looked at some rational arguments and then we looked at a number of texts from the quran which a person might use and say well does this not does this not count as an argument to you know to to justify sin and disobedience by way of allah's pre decree so we looked at all of that and we finished that entire discussion and there were many many things that we that that were raised in in the previous lessons from them is the issue of the ways and means the asbab uh the, uh the 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 created ways and means which allah has put in the creation likewise the legislated ways and means which means the acts of worship the acts of obedience by which we enter into paradise um, and how all of these are part and parcel of al qadr they are from al qadr right so there are many things that we raised in the previous uh eight or nine lessons eight lessons that is the foundation so today we're going to uh, move to the next section and this is very very important because it allows us to see the importance of believing in al qadar the necessity and the importance of believing in the divine pre decree in al qadar and likewise the necessity in believing in the legislation the law right so we have the dec- the the al qadar which is the decree and we have the shar' which is the law the necessity of believing in them both and this is a very very important uh, lesson and some important words here uh, from sheikh ibn thaymin rahimahullah who very nicely you know bring brings these affairs together so we're going to read through this inshallah step by step and um look at the commentary of the sheikh as well so the next section then fasl fi dharurat al iman bil qadar wa shar chapter on the necessity of having faith of of believing in al qadar and al shar right so al qadar is the divine pre decree predestination and a shara is the legislation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so the sheikh says la budda lil insan min al iman bil qadar li'annahu ahad arkan al iman al sitta it is necessary for a man to believe in al qadar because it is from the six pillars of iman so that's the first first explanation it is from the six pillars the six pillars of iman which is belief in allah belief in the angels belief in the books belief in the messengers belief in al qadar the good and the evil 
and belief in the last day. Right? So Al-Qadr is from these six pillars of Iman. وَلِأَنَّهُ مِنْ تَمَامِ التَّوْهِيدِ وَلِأَنَّهُ مِنْ تَمَامِ تَوْهِيدِ الرَّبُوبِيَّةِ and also because it is from the completion of Tawheed ar rububiyya Right? Meaning that Allah is the Lord and the creator and the provider and the sustainer and the creator of all things and the owner of all things and the one who controls and regulates all things. Then Al-Qadr is part and parcel of that. To believe in Al-Qadr is a completion of our belief in Allah's rububiyyah. Right? So Al-Qadr is a completion of our belief in Allah being the Lord, creator, owner, provider, sustainer, regulator, controller, and so on and so forth. وَلِأَنَّ بِهِ تَحْقِيقَ التَّوَكُّلِ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And also because by way of belief in Al-Qadr, is our reliance upon Allah actualized? Right? Because we are ordered to place our reliance upon Allah, to rely upon Allah. And our reliance upon Allah can only be by way of believing in Al-Qadr. Because when we believe Allah is the knower of all things, He has decreed all things, he is the one who wills and creates. So, when we, when we uh, proceed in our day-to-day life and our activities, then in order to be able to have tawakkal upon Allah, to have reliance upon Allah, then it requires belief in Al-Qadr. It requires belief in Al-Qadr. وَتَفْوِيضَ الْأَمْرِ إِلَيْهِ مَعَ الْقِيَامِ بِالْأَسْبَابِ السَّحِيحَةِ النَّافِعَةِ and likewise, so, so we, we have to walk upon Allah, we rely upon Allah, and we submit our affairs to Him, the outcome of those affairs to Allah. And alongside that, we also make use of the ways and the means, the beneficial ways and the means. Right? So this, this goes back to what we mentioned before, that uh, Allah Azawajal has established ways and means in His creation, and so we take the ways and means, and after taking the ways and means, we leave the affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because uh, the, the, the affair is ultimately in His hands. So just to give you a quick illustration, a quick example, it can be the case that a person sets out on a journey, and he goes into his car, and he checks everything, you know, the ties are okay, the mirrors are okay, there's enough fuel, and so on and so forth. And so he does everything within his ability to, to, to be safe and to get to where he wants to get to. So this is what we call tawakkul, right? Where you take the means. But that's only one half of, that's, that's only a part of tawakkul. Also from tawakkul is to know and to submit the affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. To know that even though you've taken all the ways and means, there are still other ways and means which are outside of your control which might prevent you from, from, your, from your desire and your wish. So for example, you could be traveling and there could be a nail or a screw or something that you, your tie goes over and it flattens, you know, your tie becomes flat. Or someone comes and bangs into you and you have an accident, right, without you knowing, right? So you could have taken all the ways and means but then this was outside of your control. So, tawakkul, reliance, is that you take the actual ways and means that's going to achieve the objective, and then after you've taken the ways and means, in your heart, you still, you submit and you relegate the affair to Allah because you know, there are, because you know that there are many other things outside of your control which are from the qadr of Allah, which are from the asbab, which are from his decrees, that could affect, you know, whatever your, whatever your goal or your, or, or, or your desire is. So, tawakkul itself, which means to take the asbab and to submit the affairs to Allah, this can only take place 
once we have established belief in Al-Qadr. Belief in Al-Qadr. So this shows the necessity of belief in Al-Qadr. Because all of these things they follow on from and they lead on from belief in Al-Qadr. So then he continues and he says, وَلِأَنَّ بِهِ وَلِأَنَّ بِهِ تَمِعْنَانَ الْإِنسَانَ فِي حَيَاتِ فِي حَيَاتِهِ حيث يعلم أن ما أصابه لم يكن ليخطئه وما أخطأه لم يكن لم يكن ليصيبه. And also because by way of belief in al qadr is the heart of a man is it calm and tranquil. This is how you have tranquility of the heart because in your life because you know that whatever afflicts you was never going to miss you. It was never going to pass you by. And whatever passes you by, whatever you miss, or you don't achieve, or it, you know, it was never going to come to you or afflict you. So this is again from the consequences of belief in Al-Qadr, in that it leads to a tranquil heart. A heart that is not disturbed by the trials and tribulations of life. And the calamities and the hardships and the pains and sufferings of life. Uh, Al-Qadr, belief in Al-Qadr, it allows uh, a person to, to accept and to submit to that and to be tranquil in his heart. وَلِأَنَّ بِهِ يَنْتَفِي الْإِعْجَابُ بِالنَّفْسِ عِنْدَ حُصُولِ الْمُرَادِ لِأَنَّهُ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّ حُصُولَهُ بِقَدَرِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ عَمْلَهُ الَّذِي حَسَلَ بِهِ مُرَادُهُ لَيْسَ إِلَّا مُجَرَّدْ سَبَبٍ يَسَرَهُ اللَّهُ لَهُ And then he says, and also, it removes from a person his amazement with himself. When a person becomes amazed with himself because of his achievement, uh, because he because he achie- achieved his wish or his desire, because in that situation he knows that whatever he achieved, he only achieved by the qadr of Allah, by the decree of Allah, and that his action that he did, by which he achieved his goal or object- objective, was only one of the causes or a cause which Allah facilitated for him. Right, so here, so on the one hand, belief in Al Qadr prevents us from despairing and being full of grief and you know becoming um, impatient and you know so on and so forth. On the other hand, it also makes us realize that whatever achievements that we have, whether that be wealth, whether that be offspring, whether that be position or status, or whatever it might be. That all of this is, is not, it, it, it's, it's by the qadr of Allah. And you only achieved these things because of the qadr of Allah, because of Allah putting the ways and means and the abilities by which people achieve things and attain things. It is something Allah facilitated for you. So this is another benefit of al-qadr, that it stops a person from becoming full of pride and arrogance and feeling, uh, you know, having this self-amazement with, with his achievements, as if everything is by his knowledge and his efforts. And then he says, after that, uh, وَلِأَنَّ بِهِ يَزُولُ الْقَلْقَ وَالدَّجَرْ uh, قَلْقَ وَالدَّجَرْ عِنْدَ فَوَاتِ الْمُرَادِ أَوْ حُصُولِ الْمَكْرُوحِ لِأَنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّ الْأَمْرَ كُلَّ, كل, كل لَهُ لِلَّهِ فَيَرْضَى وَيُسَلِّمُ and likewise, all kind of, uh, kind of disturbance in the soul, uh, grief and pain. Uh, when you lose something, or when something dislikable happens to you, then all of that ends. Because you know that the affair, all of it, it belongs to Allah, and so therefore a person, he simply is pleased, and he submits. Okay, so... In this passage here, there are, the Shaykh mentions that there are five or six things that have been mentioned here which explain the necessity of believing in Al-Qadr. So he says, first of all, 
simply, it's from the six pillars of Iman. That's straightforward. Secondly, because it is from the completion of belief in Allah's lordship, in his creatorship, in his ownership of the heavens and the earth, and him being in control. It is from the completion of that belief, secondly. And thirdly, that tawakkul, which is to rely upon Allah, reliance upon Allah. So remember, those people who do not believe in Allah, who are people of disbelief, uh, who are atheists, who are materialists, or whatever it might be, they have no notion or concept of reliance upon Allah. Obviously, they, they disbelieve in Allah. And so their reliance is upon their own efforts, their own beliefs, their own uh, striving, their own you know, uh, knowledge, their own skill, their own expertise. And often, uh, when these things don't happen, when, these things, when they don't attain or achieve what they want to achieve, then, they, then all these other things follow on from that. Despair, disappointment, anger, disturbance. The, these are now, if you like, the diseases of the heart. Right? The, these things uh, develop and start appearing. And this is why, and we covered this in a previous lesson, we mentioned amongst the atheists and the materialists, you will see that they, you know, they, uh, they are the most pessimistic uh, about life, and they are the ones among whom we find the greatest suicide rates where they take their own lives, you know, um, because they, they don't have these affairs by which tranquility of the heart and the patience of the heart is, is established. So, um, uh, so, so the, the whole notion of tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't actually exist. Right? And this leads to many of these other types of things. And likewise, you find it among sinful Muslims. Obviously, Muslims who are weak, they don't have strong iman, they don't have uh, knowledge, they don't have understanding, and they likewise fall into some of these affairs. So, point three being... That tawakkul can only be actualized with the belief in al-qadr. That Allah knows all things and he decrees all things and he wills all things and he brings them to be. And uh, so therefore we uh, take the asbab, we employ the ways and means, but at the same time we leave the affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there are many things which are outside of our control. Uh, in fact, the Sheikh gives a number of, of examples here. He says, look, for example, I might travel to uh, do some business or do some trade. And alongside my knowledge that if Allah wills, I will profit. If Allah wills, I will take a loss. And either way, as long as I believe in Al-Qadr, then I will leave the affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because everything is by his decree, is by his will, is by his power. And through this, I will then make reliance upon Allah. So I will take the means and I will leave the affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter what the outcome, I will be pleased, I will be satisfied. And you know, this is from, from the fruits of belief in Al-Qadr. So that's, that's the third thing. The fourth thing is because by it, there is tranquility in the heart of a person. And likewise, in his life in general, he has tranquility. Because whatever harm comes to him, it is by the decree of Allah. And whatever benefit comes to him, it is by the decree of Allah. And um, the more he increases in his iman, in al-qadr, then the greater tranquility he will have in his life. And then the shaykh goes on to give us three, uh, a number of texts, uh, and he says, for example, Al-Qama, rahimahullah, he is one of the students of the uh, companion Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. And he said, there's a verse in the Quran in which Allah says, وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ Whoever believes in Allah, he will guide his heart aright. He said, what this means, what this verse is referring to is a man who is afflicted with a calamity and he knows it is from Allah and then he is pleased with it and he submits to this. 
right? So a person, a believer who is like this in the face of calamities, then he will always be guided aright. His heart is always guided aright. Likewise, from Usama bin Zayd, radiallahu anhu, who mentions that there was a uh, one, one of the uh, daughters of the Prophet sallallahu uh, one of her daughters was, was passing away And so she sent message to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And so he sent back and responded By uh, making, by stating Inna lillahi ma akhad wa ma a'ata Indeed to Allah belongs what he took and what he gives What he takes and what he gives Wa kullu shay'in indahu musamma Everything with Allah is with an appointed time. With an appointed time. فَالْتَحْتَسِبْ tasbir. So therefore, seek, uh, anticipate your reward from Allah and show patience. Right? So this is the advice of the Messenger of Allah when, you know, when there's going to be a, a bereavement, a death in the family or something, that... To Allah belongs everything. Allah, uh, Allah is the one who gave the offspring, and Allah is the one who takes, whether it's the offspring or the wealth or whatever it might be. And everything has its appointed time. So everything, every occurrence has its appointed time. So therefore, anticipate your reward from Allah and be patient. So, meaning that there's no decree which is decreed, which, which is possible to, to remove. Or to turn back. Nobody can do that. And everything which is decreed is going to happen whether you like it or not. And therefore, whatever comes your way of good or evil, then you have to be pleased or satisfied with it. So if, if an illness comes to you, you say, Alhamdulillah, I'm the servant of Allah. Allah does whatever he wishes with me. In it is wisdom. And so, so no one will find tranquility in his heart greater than the one who is a, is a believer in Al-Qadr. Likewise, the famous hadith of Suhaib radiallahu anhu who said that the messenger of Allah sallam, he said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ mu'min, How amazing is the affair of the believer. إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خير. Indeed, all of his affair is goodness. وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ and this is not for anyone except the believer. If something pleasing comes to him in asaba tu sarra shakar, fakana khairan lahu, he is grateful and that is better for him. Wa in asaba tu darra sabar fakana khairan lahu. And if hardship or something which he dislikes comes to him, then he shows patience, and that is better for him. So. Um, the Sheikh says, after mentioning all of these texts, if you want a happy life, a tranquil life, a joyous life, then upon you is to actualize this belief in Al-Qadr. And if good comes to you, be grateful. If dislikable things come to you, have patience, because all of it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how a person has tranquility in his life, true tranquility in his life. Anyhow, that's the fourth issue to be taken from this passage. And the fifth issue is that, well, that, that Sheikh mentioned is because it removes this self-amazement and this arrogance and being pleased with oneself and thinking that everything that you have is purely by your achievements alone, by your knowledge, by your skill, by your efforts. Um, so, amazement... Arrogance is removed from the believer by way of his belief in Al-Qadr. The Sheikh goes on to explain how you see many amongst mankind, when they achieve their goal, that whatever that goal might be, you know, it could be wealth, it could be status, could be position, could be offspring, could be whatever it might be, he ascribes it to himself. He, say, he says, I'm the one who did this, and... Uh, in fact, Allah Azawajal, He prohibited that such a thing be said. Innama utituhu ala ilmin indi. Like that a person say, well, the reason why I'm so rich is because I'm so smart, I'm so clever, I have this tremendous amount of knowledge about the markets, about products, about services, about this, about that, whatever. 
And, you know, he, he ascribes it all to himself and his knowledge and his activities, his efforts, because obviously he's, he's amazed with himself. But in reality, um, everything that this person has of, uh, for example, hearing and seeing and the ability to know and the ability to reflect and the physical ability to uh, do things, to, you know, do, uh, to, to engage in any kind of uh, a trade, um, and then even the whole uh, system of causes and their effects which Allah has put in creation through which mankind uh, uh, researches and produces product, products and services, all of that is from Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator of all of that. So nothing you did emanated from yourself independently. All of it has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore for you to have this amazement with yourself, and to be pleased with yourself, or to, you know, to, 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 to be arrogant, then this is something Allah has prohibited, because it is, it, it, it is, it is arrogance, and like it's something that is blameworthy. But if a person believes in Al-Qadr, and a person will say, this what I have, what I've achieved, is by the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I am nothing more than a means or a cause, whatever I did, I took the ways and means, Allah then gave me tawfiq. Allah gave me success by allowing those means to come into fruition. And that's the reason why I have the wealth or the offspring or whatever else it might be. It, it is because, because of Allah's decree. And um, that's why we see that not everybody, not every person who takes the ways and means, is he successful? Not everybody is, is rich, not everybody is affluent, not everybody is, you know, has, has uh, offspring and so on and so forth. Because the asbab, the ways and means, they are, they are you know, Allah is the one who makes them have the effect. Uh, so, these are some of the points that can be taken from, uh, the, uh, from this passage. And also, the Sheikh goes on to explain that the asbab, the ways and means they definitely have an effect by the, by the will and by the permission of Allah. He mentions from them a dua making supplication is from the greatest of ways and means because dua can repel al-qada, it can repel the decree. And what this means is that making dua is part and parcel of al-qadr, right? So for example, it could be the case that... Um, you know, that, that, that it's written in the preserved tablet that this servant, particular servant, would become ill or have an accident. But by way of dua, he will make dua, and because of the dua, then that calamity is repelled. Right? So that is within the decree of Allah and written in the preserved tablet, like the actual events and the causes that lead to them are the causes that prevent them from, 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 from happening. All of that is within the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyhow, these, so, so this opening passage of the Shaykh to, explains to us the necessity of believing in Al-Qadr. These are the fruits, these are the consequences that a believer is strong, he is tranquil, he is not full of arrogance and amazement, and um, you know he, he is able to make tawakkal upon Allah, he submits the affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these, al-qadr is a necessity because of these reasons. Now, the shaykh then goes on to mention an evidence from the Qur'an to show that this, this is precisely from the, the fruits and the consequences of al-qadr. And that verse in the Qur'an is in Surah Al-Hadid, Surah 57, verse number 22, in which Allah Azawajal says, مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبَلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ There is no calamity which befalls in the earth or in your souls except that it is in a book before we bring it into existence. Indeed, that is easy for Allah. لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ 
Fakhur. In order that, so now this explains the, the, the wisdom, in order that you may not grieve or become sad over that which has passed you by, and nor that you may rejoice over that which, has, which Allah has given you, meaning rejoice with, with arrogance and with pride, over that which Allah has given you. And indeed, Allah does not love every boastful, uh, you know, the one who is boastful and full of pride. So the Sheikh says here in this verse, Allah Azawajal, he says that, he, first of all, he mentions whatever calamity befalls you in the earth, fil ard. So this could be, for example, it could be a famine. It could be the failure of crops to grow. It could be anything which afflicts on, on the earth. It could be a tornado, it could be an earthquake, it could be a flood, it could be any type of calamity which occurs upon the earth, fil ard. وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ And nor in your own souls, so that which happens in the souls, which is illness, death, loss of wealth, and whatever is similar. So on the earth or in your own souls, except it is in a book, إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ which is the preserved tablet, مِنْ قَابَلِي أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا Before we bring it into existence. And then Allah Azawajal explained the wisdom behind that. So he said, لِكَيْلَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ So that you do not become sad or grieve over that which passed you by, and nor that you rejoice over that which, we, which He has given you. And what is meant here by rejoicing is not rejoicing in and of itself, it is the rejoicing in which there is al-batr, meaning to, to, uh, to be arrogant and to look down upon other people as if <coughs> somehow you are superior and better than other people just because Allah Zawajal has favored you and given you wealth or offspring or whatever it might be, possessions or whatever it might be, from His bounty and His favor. Right? Um, as, for, as for being pleased in a way which is in accordance with the Sharia, then this is something which is, which is, which is uh, good, something which is, uh, which is um, praiseworthy. So it doesn't mean to say that you can't be pleased and happy with your own deeds and your achievements. No, this is referring to pride and arrogance and belittling other people and looking down upon other people. And we see in the Qur'an, Allah Zawajal, He says, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Say in the bounty of Allah and His mercy, let them rejoice in that. It is better than whatever they gather together of wealth. Right? This verse means that rejoice in the guidance and in the sending of the Prophet, the Messenger to you. Right? Because this is, is the great happiness and rejoicement. This is what you should rejoice with. It is better than the physical things that you gather and you... Um, so, so you can be pleased with the favors and the bounties of Allah Azza wa Jal, absent pride and arrogance and looking down upon other people. And then he says, "Wallahu la yuhibbu kulla muqtalin fakhur." At the end of the verse, Allah does not like every uh, arrogant boaster or braggart, one who you know boasts and brags. Uh, so the Sheikh says, the one who, for example, he might boast about his appearance and boast with his tongue or he might say I did such and such and um, you know all of this 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 amazement uh, with oneself then it means that you are kind of ascribing goodness to yourself without you mentioning the favor and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, so it's as if that you know his own achievements his own knowledge his own skill his own efforts Right? He's pleased on account of that as a result of which he has some degree of pride or arrogance. Right? So this is what's, what's uh, prohibited. But as for simply being pleased with the deeds that you have done to be pleased, then there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallam. Uh, it's related that Ibn Umar, uh, that his father Umar bin al-Khattab, once he gave a khutbah, uh, 
in, in a place called Al Jabiya, and he said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu that he stood amongst us and he said, and then he said the following Istausu bi ashabi khaira, which means that uh, basically follow my companions in goodness. Thumma ladina yalunahum. Then those who came after them, Thumma ladina yalunahum. Then those who come after them. Thumma yafshul kadib. Then lying will become widespread. Hatta inna rajul. Uh, until a man la yabtadi obi shahada rabla an yus alaha. That a man will start to give testimony before he's even asked to give testimony. فَمَنْ أَرَادَ مِنْكُمْ بَحْبَهَةَ الْجَنَّةِ فَلْيَلْزَمِ الْجَمَاعَةِ Whoever amongst you wants to enter into paradise, then let him, uh, let him adhere to the jama'ah, to, to the group, to the unity. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ مَعَ الْوَاهِدِ For indeed shaitan is with the, the sole person, the one who isolates himself and is alone. وَهُوَ مِنَ الْإِثْنَيْنِ أَبْعَدِ And he is further away from two people. لا لا يخلون أحدكم بمرأة فإن الشيطان ثالثهما. Let not one of you be alone with a woman, with a woman, for indeed shaitan will be the third. And now he's the he's the part he's the the point of evidence now at the end of the hadith. ومن سرته حسنته وساءته سيئته فهو مؤمن. He whose good deed pleases him and whose evil deed uh, saddens him or harms him, then he is a believer. Right? So this now is the point of evidence. So what did the messenger of Allah, what, uh, what did he say? He said, whoever is pleased by way of his good deed. Right? And whoever is harmed by way of his evil deed. Meaning he... He, you know, he he feels uh, grief or sadness because of uh, an evil deed which he did. Then he is the believer, right? So this shows and it proves this textual proof that merely being pleased with with your good deed. Obviously, this is this can be like your acts of worship, the charity that you gave, the Quran that you read or you completed, or whatever else it might might be, and it pleases you. Well, you can be pleased. You can be pleased by your deeds and by your efforts. Just like similarly, you can be pleased by your efforts in the world. If you attained wealth, you can be pleased with attaining wealth. There's nothing wrong with that in itself. Uh, you can be pleased with you know, achievements in the worldly sense. There's nothing wrong with that. But what is being referred to here is arrogance and boasting and being full of pride and looking down upon people and thinking that this is because of your efforts and your skill and failing to acknowledge that everything you have, that it only came by way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He is the creator of all things, He is the creator of the ways and means, He is the creator of you, and your faculties, and your abilities, and all of your actions, they themselves are creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and yet you, 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 know, you failed to, to acknowledge any of that, and you ascribed it to yourself. So this is self amazement which is you know which is from the from from the uh, the major sins the arrogance and pride. Okay. So all of this that we've discussed so far explains to us the necessity of belief in al-qadr. Right? And these are the consequences or the benefits or the fruits of believing in al-qadr. However, the other half is to believe in the Sharia, to believe in the legislation, right? So now the Sheikh is going to also summarize for us also why it is necessary to believe in Al Qadr, uh, to, to believe in a Sharia, ah, which is the legislation. And again, this is a very very important passage uh, to reflect upon. And so the Sheikh says, and it has some very good uh, reasoning and explanation. The Sheikh says, وَلَا بُدَّ لِلْإِنسَانِ أَيْدًا مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ بِالشَّرَعِ It is also necessary for a man to believe in a shara, which is the legislation. وَهُوَ مَا جَاءَتْ بِهِ الرُّسَلِ عَلِهِمُ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامِ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ وَنَحِيهِ 
وما وما يترتب عليهما من الجزاء ثوابا او عقابا and this is whatever the messengers upon them be uh, salat and salam uh, what they brought of the command of allah and the prohibition of allah and likewise whatever results from that of reward and punishment fayaqumu bima yalzamuhu nahw al amr wa nahi wa yu'minu bima yatarattab alayhima min al jaza'i wal athar so therefore what does he do after believing in the legislations of allah and that the messengers came with command and prohibition what does he do and that he will be rewarded and punished well he does what is binding upon him right meaning that he does the command and he keeps away from the prohibition and he believes in what the consequences are of the reward of the recompense and the the effects in the hereafter right so what what the sheikh is mentioning here that on the one hand we have al qadar which has all of those fruits and consequences and which is necessary to believe in and then on the other hand we also have the legislation and part and from the legislation is to believe in the command and the prohibition and the reward and punishment resulting from from doing that or not doing that right so the sheikh then goes on to explain the wisdom behind why legislation of the law is necessary just like belief in al qadar is necessary and he explains it as follows he says wa dhalika li anna al insana muridun right he says this is because man is one who wishes he has a desire right so all of mankind every man no particular man we're not speaking about a believer specifically but all 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 of mankind he is created with a desire he has an irada and fala budda lahu min fi'l min min fi'l min fi'l yudriku bihi ma yurid and it is also necessary that this person has deeds has an action by which he can reach or obtain that which he desires wa yadfa'u bihi ma la yurid and by which he can repel that which he does not desire okay the sheikh is pointing out here just a reality about all of mankind that all of mankind and irrespective of whether you are are a muslim or a non muslim a jew christian the whole of mankind everyone has an irada he has a wish generally what is that wish the wish is i want to remove harm from myself and i want to attain benefit for myself right this is something that all of mankind has with him and which basically drives him in his life to make the relevant choices in his life right because this is what drives everybody there's an irada there's the desire and that desire is to attain the benefit and to repel the harm right so this now is universal then he says wala budda lahu min dabitin يضبط تصرفه لئلا يقع فيما يضره او يفوته ما ينفعه من حيث لا يشعر however on top of this a person must also have a principle a dhabit like some sort of rule or principle which guides him so that he does not fall into what harms him or that he loses that which might benefit him without him realizing right so this shows the necessity of every person having something that guides and governs his desire and his action right because everybody has irada and fi'l all of mankind has irada and fi'l he has a wish and he has the deed by which he wants to obtain his wish right and generally for all of mankind that is removal of harm 
and attainment of, of benefit, right? But there has to be some guiding principle, there has to be some, some rule or some law uh, which, uh, which, which allows him to attain that objective. And he says, وَالشَّرْعُ الْإِلَاهِ الَّذِي جَاءَتْ بِهِ الرُّسُلْ هُوَ الَّذِي يَضْبِطُ ذَلِكِ Right. It is the divine legislation which the messengers have come with that is what defines or dictates what the rule is, what the guiding principle is that should be followed. And وَيُسْدِرُ الْحُكْمَ بِهِ And which brings forth the ruling in respect to it. وَيَكُونُ بِهِ التَّمْيِيزِ بِنَ النَّافِعْ وَالدَّارِ وَالصَّالِحِ وَالْفَاسِدِ and by which, that which is beneficial and harmful and righteous and corrupt can be distinguished. Because this law, لِأَنَّهُ مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ This law is from Allah, Al-Alim, Al-Rahim, Al-Hakim, who is all-knowing and all-merciful and all-wise. Okay, so here, what we see is that the Sheikh has explained that by necessity of a man being one who has a will, he has an irada, he has a desire, a wish, and he has deeds, then these things need to be regulated or have a principle by which the beneficial from them can be distinguished from the harmful from them. And the only thing that can do that is the law that Allah revealed upon the tongues of His messengers. Nothing else, I mean, <coughs> uh, there are other things as the, as the Shaykh will explain in what follows. Like for example, we, we do have knowledge of what is right and wrong, beneficial and harmful to a certain degree by way of experience, by way of reason, by way of innate, original, the intuition, the disposition, we can know things, that, that's true. But what defines all of that comprehensively and in detail, then that is the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is explained further by what follows. The Shaykh then goes on to say, he says, وَالْعُقُول, وَالْعُقُول the intellects, وَإِن كَانَتْ تُدْرِكُ النَّافِعْ وَالدَّارِ فِي الْجُمْلَةِ لَكِنَّ تَفْصِيلَ ذَلِكَ وَالْإِحَاطَةَ بِهِ إِحَاطَةً تَامَةً إِنَّمَا يَكُونُ مِنْ جِهَةِ الشَّرَعِ Right? So we are not denying, we are not denying that reason, intellect, even though it can acquire knowledge of benefit and harm, generally speaking, the details of all of that and treating them comprehensively, this can only come by way of the legislation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلِهَذَا نَقُولُ And for this reason we say, النَّفْعَ أَوَ الدَّرْ Benefit and harm, what is beneficial and harmful, it can sometimes be known by way of fitra, by way of a person's intuition or natural disposition. وَقَدْ يَكُونُ مَعْلُومًا بِالْأَقَلْ It can also be known by way of reason. Right? So what is beneficial and harmful, we can also know by way of reason. وَقَدْ يَكُونُ مَعْلُومًا بِالتَّجَارُبِ It can also be known by practical experience, by physical experience. We know that this is beneficial, this is harmful. Like you could eat plants, as people would eat plants, and then one person gets poisoned and dies, then we know this is, this is poisonous. Right? We know this is harmful. <coughs> so by experience we know things are harmful or beneficial. وَقَدْ يَكُونُ مَعْلُومًا بِالشَّرْعِ and it can also be known by way of legislation, right? So basically, there are four ways by which we can know what is harmful and what is beneficial. It is, first of all, the, the intuition that we have been given. Every, everyone has been given the natural, original disposition, the fitra. Secondly, by way of reason, the use, application of reason. Thirdly, by way of actual experience, practical experience, we, we come to know very quickly uh, what is harmful, what is uh, beneficial. And fourthly, by way of the revelation, by way of the law. Now, 
the Sheikh goes on to say that the role of legislation for Shara Yati Mu'ayyidan Lima Shahadat Shahidat Bihil Fitra Wal Akal Wat Tajarub. The law, the law, the legislation of Allah comes in order to strengthen, to strengthen what the fitra and aql and tajarub, meaning the fitra, intuition and reason and experience, what they have come to know, you know, what, what, what they know. In other words, the law, the legislation comes to support and to strengthen what is already known and witnessed by way of these three other things. The intuition, the uncorrupted intuition, the fitra, the reason, and practical experience. And so, the, so, and so, and so this, and these other things, these three things, the fitra, the aql, and tajarub, they in turn, they come and they bear a witness. They bear witness to the sharia. Right? So how is this working? Let, let me give you an example. Let's take, for example, alcohol. Right? Or drugs or intoxicants. Everybody knows by way of experience, by tajarub, by way of reason, and even by way of intuition, that if you take intoxicants, alcohol, you lose your mind, you, you are befogged of your mind, and by, by practical experience we know that people who drink alcohol, they have liver damage, they have cancers, they have domestic violence, many of the crimes which take place in society, about 50% of them are under the influence of alcohol, and so there's uh, you know, you know, domestic violence in the house, there are murders, there are things that take place. Husband kills his wife because he's angry, he's come back, he's, you know, his football team lost to the, to the uh, away team, and he's been drinking alcohol, he comes and, and he you know, beats his wife or whatever, right? So these are things that they know through experience, that this is harmful, harmful. And then there's harm to the, to the economy as well, right? That when you have a nation of drunkards who drink alcohol, then so much money is wasted on unnecessary medication, healthcare, hospital beds, you know, social services for domestic violence. It, 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 it brings into the society so many evils that are not necessary that then destroy many other aspects of, of society, right? So this is, this is known by experience. So when the Sharia comes, the law of Allah, when it comes and it prohibits alcohol and declares it to be from the, the work of shaitan, from the work of Iblis and prohibits it, then the law is only strengthening and confirming what is known by experience and reason. And conversely, reason and experience, they bear a witness to the truth of what the law has brought, right? And so this is the nature of, of the law brought by the prophets and messengers. It is the truth. It commands all that is beneficial. It prohibits all that is harmful. And real life and reason bear witness to the truth of what the legislation has come with, right? So the qadr of Allah bears witness to the truth of the shara. Of Allah, right? What Allah decrees to happen. And so this we can apply to all things. We can apply to usury, interest, uh, how it is, uh, how Allah has declared a war against interest, the usury, right? Because usury is the basis of the destruction of, of nations when they deal in, um, you know, in interest. And that's what we see in the modern era with all of these uh, kind of nations uh, who... Um, whose economies run on interest, what happens is that give it four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten decades, then the people will uh, be born into slavery. Right? So if, if your nation deals in interest, then after the passing of generations, your, answer, your, your, your descendants will eventually wake up one day when they are absolute total slaves. And that's What's going to happen, it's already happened, but what's going to happen to these Western nations because they're all in debt to the tune of trillions and trillions and trillions because the way the economies work is that the government borrows from a private central bank the, 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 the money which is created as debt and then they are 
worked to death to pay that interest uh, by way of taxes. And over time, over the passing of generations, the actual real uh, physical wealth in that nation of property, land, minerals, resources is gradually taken control of by the, by the ones who give the loans until the whole country is literally taken and stripped. And, you know, after some generations, nobody owns anything and everybody born is therefore born as a slave. Right? And that's, that's what they mean when they say today, you've heard this statement, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That's literally what they mean. You will own nothing. Right? Because um, all of the printing of this money, the trillions and trillions and trillions, you have to pay. That's being printed because you're going to pay for it. Right? And so when the amount of money that's printed and the debt that's created is more than the value of all of the assets in a country, that means you've just been turned into, into a slave because nothing, nobody has property anymore. Right? It's all owned, it's, it's been snatched by the, by, the, by the creditors, the ones who, you know, right? And so this is why usury in, in the Qur'an, Allah has declared a war from Allah for people who do not abandon, you know, who let go of the, uh, the, the usury. So that's, that's usury, that's alcohol, then there's fornication, then there's like, many other things, uh, which when you look at the sharia, sharia of Islam, it has come with the truth. It has come with rectification, it has come to make societies prosper, and everything that we see in these societies bears witness to the justice and the truth of the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only reason you hear, you hear all of these people, um, the only reason you have all this propaganda, inshallah, we'll, 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 we'll come to an end, we'll, we'll continue this discussion in the, uh, or we'll finish this off in the next lesson. But the only reason, just to finish off on this point, the only reason why you have all of these, uh, this propaganda against uh, Islam and the Sharia is precisely because the people who benefit the most the people who benefit the most from these things which destroy society, which is usury, and which is alcohol, and which is intoxicants, and gambling, and fornication, and illicit relationships. There are people out there who make billions upon billions upon billions out of these vices because they know that <clears throat> people have an irada, which can be corrupted. And so they make billions and billions and billions. So when Islam, <coughs> the Sharia of Islam, when it comes and it puts an end to all of these evils, you will find that the greatest enemies and opponents to the call of the messengers are these rich and wealthy elite, right, who have something to lose if people abandon alcohol, abandon fornication, abandon illicit relationships, abandon gambling, abandon all these frivolities, which, which, you know, and instead they live a meaningful life uh, based upon the worship of Allah, right? They stand to lose. And so therefore, these are the types of people. And that's why in all the stories of the prophets in the Quran, you will see that, you know, the, the, the mala, the mala is like the, you know, the, the heads of the people of disbelief. The elites, the powerful, rich, and the elites of the people of disbelief, they are always the ones who stand against the messengers, reject their message, and then they lie to the people, they tell lies to the people in order to stop them from hearing the message of, of the prophets, right? As they did with Nuh and with Hud and with Saleh, and this is what they do. And so that's exactly what you see today in relation to the, uh, to, the, to the Qur'an, to the final message, you see all of this propaganda and lies against Islam, about women, about this, about that, about the barbaric sharia, you know, all of this is part and parcel of that propaganda to stop people from accepting the truth, and that in which true rectification lies for them. But anyhow, uh, there's... Uh, very interesting treatment here by Sheikh Ibn Thaymeen, which we'll finish with, which is basically that the Sharia comes to support and strengthen what is known 
by fitra and reason and by practical experience. And fitra, reason and practical experience, they bear witness and testify to the correctness of what the Sharia has, has brought. And... Okay, yeah, we can finish on that note, inshallah, and there's a point we'll, we'll take up. Uh, and in fact, let's just finish this point then for the sake of completion. One final point the Sheikh begins, uh, finishes with, which is to say, okay, um, this raises the question, which is, how do we know whether something is good or evil? Can it be known by reason before revelation or can it only be known after revelation has come? Right? This is a question that arises, right? And this is a very important question because there are so many other aspects of belief to do with Al-Qadr. They, they follow on from this. But let me, just to give you, um, to, give you uh, uh, to give you an example what this means. Stealing, for example. Is stealing, is stealing wrong? Do we know that stealing is wrong by reason? Or do we say stealing is only wrong after the revelation says it's wrong? Do you understand? Right. What, what the issue is here is what determines what is evil, what is, what is wrong? Can that be known by reason before revelation? Or is it the case that something only becomes wrong after revelation? Do you understand? So the, what, what the meaning is here, for example, if I steal from someone, right, I can say, well, you can say, well, hang on, that stealing is not wrong because the revelation hasn't come yet to say that it's wrong. And then the revelation comes and says stealing is wrong. Only now can it be said to be wrong. Right? So the issue here is, did stealing become wrong only after revelation came? Or is it the case that stealing is still wrong as recognized by the reason before revelation? Do you understand? Right? And so what, what is correct is, this is like an issue, uh, what is correct is that basically the way we know things are right and wrong, sometimes it can be known by the intellect, sometimes it can be known by the revelation only, sometimes it can be known by them both. It can be known by them both. And however, the detailed knowledge and comprehensive knowledge of everything that is right and wrong, beneficial, harmful, that is only comprised in the Sharia, in the, in the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So basically, we are not denying that reason can figure out that something is good or bad. Right? And that's why in the legislations of many of the non-Muslims, obviously there are many things which are obviously correct. Right? Murder is prohibited, stealing is prohibited, uh, you know, these things are known by way of reason. We, we can't say, well, the only way something becomes good or bad is after the revelation comes and says it's bad. No. Right? Adultery is evil because reason knows it to be evil before it, you know, before any revelation comes. And then revelation comes and describes it as evil. Right? And, and declares it to be unlawful. Right? So it's known to be so by reason and by revelation. Okay, so anyhow, this is a topic uh, that the Sheikh mentioned very briefly. Uh, at tahseen wa taqbih is what it's called in, in Arabic. And um, there are many very important issues of belief connected to that, but we're not going to focus on that. Uh, the Sheikh just mentioned it here. And with that, we'll bring our lesson to a close. So just to recap, basically, the importance of believing in Al-Qadr and the importance of of believing in the legislation, right? Legislation is a necessity for mankind. There has to be legislation, right? By which the irada and the fi'l of mankind is, um, is, um, is put right, is put right, right? And likewise, al-qadr, belief in al-qadr is a necessity as well. And from it come all of those fruits, to walk upon Allah, uh, being humble and being tranquil and not being arrogant, not being amazed with oneself and taking the ways and means and, you know, all of these. And so that's why there is nothing but 
uh, uh, tremendous goodness in believing al- in Al-Qadr and acting by the Shara, acting by the legislation. And when the people do that, honestly, truthfully, sincerely, then this is when the affairs of mankind, they become rectified and they become, uh, you know, they, they, they are rectified. So with that, we'll conclude our lesson there for today. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So, God, I 